Um, let's start with introducing our panel. I think um, if we start, maybe everyone gives a sort of a little bit of a personal recap of to where you started out in your career, and then we'll do another round of intros where you talk a bit about more specifically about what your role is now. That would be great. So I will kick off and just say that I've got a background in film journalism, which I did for about 10 years. I've also been a producer, so I've worked on a couple of feature docs and shorts and that sort of thing, and I'm now commissioning at Random Act, so that's the sort of potted history of me. If you guys could do the same, that would be great. Um, so hello, my name is Jude. Um, my background is a mix of kind of working for film festivals, um, including Encounters in Bristol, and uh, working on youth filmmaking projects, and I'm currently project manager on a new short film programme called Short Flicks. I am Rick. Uh, I'm, my background is pretty much all production. Uh, I started off running and then I've worked my way up to what I do now is producing and I commission music videos for Wolf Records as well. Hi, I'm Greta. I'm from a visual arts background. I started out working in a gallery and then moved on to uh, not-for-profit commissioning in the arts, um, kind of cross-medium and now work specifically with Artists Moving Image. I'm Alex, I'm a uh, head of arts account from Little Dot Studios, which is a producer and digital broadcaster. Uh, my background is more of traditional television, uh, I was at Maverick Television for around 10 years, uh, a bit of time at the BBC before that. Uh, I've specialised in generally multi platform rather than traditional TV, but um, there's been quite a lot of crossover in my career, so I'll talk to you about that. I should also say a big thanks to Alex who stepped in at the last minute to replace Matumba from the BFI. Um, apologies there, unavoidable crash. I'm sorry that <laughs> <laughs> I've dealt with it. Yeah. <laughs> so, and on a more detailed level, um, the the sort of the day to day of your role, I will start with myself again. Uh, I'm the commissioner for Random Acts. That is Channel 4's kind of premium art strand for short form. So we commission around 83 to 4 minute films per year for broadcast, and then we also work with five regional network centres, of which the ICA is one to deliver, I think it's 80 a year uh, short films from 16 to 24 year old filmmakers. I know that there's actually a lot of them in the room today, maybe even the majority of you, I don't know, have been involved with that scheme at some point or other. Um, so my day is, uh, a lot of it is looking at pitches, deciding whether to give people commissions. And then I'm also still working as an independent producer. So the other half of my day is trying to figure out how to get other people to give me commissions. So I'm sort of sitting on both sides of that fence um, I mean, I did look into whether it was possible to commission myself, apparently that's Matt. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, on the day-to-day -day and the organisation you work for at the moment. Um, so I actually work for Creative England, um, and our remit very much focuses on the English regions outside of London, so supporting emerging and new filmmakers in regions. Um, we are part of the BFI's network, so we work with... Um, Northern Ireland Screen, uh, Creative Scotland, Film Agency Wales and Film London. Um, uh, in terms of short flicks, the new programme we're running is a partnership with um, the um, National Youth Theatre and Sky Arts. And um, we've actually just had our application deadline on Wednesday. Um, I don't know if any of you have heard. Oh. Um, uh, so at the moment, I'm very much <coughs> focused on um, going for applications and assessing colleagues um, and we will by the end of March hopefully have 20 projects going to the development phase. So there's probably two, well, two jobs. Uh, producing for Pulse Films uh, for the music department. So I generally work across uh, with all the directors working on their treatments that come in and developing all the work with them. Um, producing is kind of multifaceted thing, definitely with directors trying to balance how you're going to make it for the money and the creative involved as well. Um, and then on the flip side, I also commission for Wolf Records, so I work a lot with artists and uh, working with their release schedules and everything for their tracks to go out. So it's a case of putting pictures out or briefs out uh, and uh, linking up the right directing talent with the right track and the right song. Um, can I just get you to say a little bit more about what Pulse is? Because, I mean, you guys work with film all so, the time, pretty exciting films. Pulse is like a, a behemoth of, of 
media, I suppose. We, we do everything from film, documentary, TV, commercials, music documentary, music videos, uh, and content as well. Um, most of the work we do, or most of the recent work you've probably seen is stuff like uh, Beyonce's Lemonade, I've worked with Flying Lotus and hoping to show you a trailer for a, a recent film that's going to come out soon for Sanfa. Um, we won a couple of awards last year for best music video. Um, yeah, that kind of we do a lot of different things. Most most of the heritage of Pulse is through music and music film. So we did uh, LCD sound system documentary. Um, we've got Bjork and Nick Cave. Yes, yeah, it's, it's all nice. pretty cool, really. So, yeah, <laughs> stuff. <laughs> I was trying to not name drop, but here's the <laughs> no, do, do you name drop? <laughs> um, that's pretty much it. Great. Uh, so, um, Flamin or Film London Artists Moving Image Network, our remit is to um, support UK-based artists working in moving image in all of its forms, and we do that through um, commissioning schemes and development schemes. And then in partnership with Channel 4, we also run an award called the Jarman Award for artists that have made a significant contribution to the medium of moving image. And uh, Channel 4 generously supports a program of random acts. Um, so any artist that's shortlisted for that award then gets to um, make a random act as well. So kind of day to day is if we've got an, um, a scheme open for application, looking through applications and deciding whether we'll commission those artists to make work. And then also running um, kind of development schemes that go throughout the year, um, introducing artists to um, professionals from the film industry that might be able to help them um, support getting their work made. Um, so, uh what, this, what, do, what do I do? So, so Little Dot, like I say, is a, is a um, sort of hybrid between a producer and a broadcaster. It's a very new company. It's only a few years old. Um, it's got lots of parts of the business that are not necessarily relevant to, to you guys. But I suppose it, it probably represents new, a new model of production company, one that isn't just focused on producing content for on commission but um, is focused on producing content for brands, uh, creating uh, IP by sort of coming up with completely new business models and ideas. Um, one of the ones that I work on is something called Real Stories, which is a, a documentary uh, channel on YouTube. Uh, it primarily at the moment draws its content from existing documentaries that have been made that are just not seen by anyone anymore because they're on the, literally on a shelf somewhere in the gathering dust and we, uh, we acquire them uh, tart them up a bit and broadcast them to a new worldwide audience. Um, so that is something that we've we built from scratch over the last 18 months and we're getting to the point now where we're actually looking at how we start commissioning our own content, what that content is. Um, we're mainly focused on YouTube. We are launching on Facebook and we have a very different Facebook strategy that's probably going to be focused more around shorter form content. YouTube loves long form, Facebook at the moment still loves short form, Facebook will love long form as well very soon. Um, so we're hoping we'll be able to kind of sort of come at it from two sides. Um, but yeah, so day to day I look, uh, look after that. I also am quite heavily involved in the more traditional side of <coughs> developing ideas that will probably go to a, a TV network to be hopefully commissioned. So working on stuff for uh, Channel 4, um, uh, Red Bull Television uh, amongst, and CBBC as well to complete a slightly random so we've got a real mixture here of people who've got experience of going in and you know doing a pitch and maybe it went brilliantly, maybe it went terribly, we've got people on the other side of that, so hopefully you're all going to have lots of different questions for us. Um, I think before we sort of go any further, it'd be really good to have a sense of you guys in the room and sort of do that, I'm sorry, slightly primary school thing of getting people to stick their hands up so that we can have a sense of what is helpful for you to hear about. So um, could you put your hand up if you've made at least one short film? Um, and can you keep your hand up if that short film was commissioned by somebody rather than just sort of something you made in your bedroom? Well, including Random Acts. Including Random Acts, yeah. <laughs> um, has anyone made a feature? Documentary. Cool, nice. Um, so I guess, yeah, so sort of people, who, is it, does this sound right? People who've made their first film, maybe through a scheme like Random Acts, maybe independently, and you're looking to sort of take the next step. Is that about right? Lots of nodding heads, excellent. Uh, I thought maybe what we could start with uh, on stage, but do jump in with any questions at any time, 
is do's and don'ts of commissioning from your personal experience. Um, commissioning a picture. Well, I guess, yeah, pictures, you're right. Okay. Thank you, Alex. I brought him along to correct me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, do's and don'ts of pitching. Um, so in your experience as somebody who reads a lot of pictures, um, what are some of the, what are sort of commonest errors that you think that you see? Um, I mean, you'll probably get different answers on this, but um, from my own point of view and being in the middle of um, looking at pictures at the moment, because what we asked um, to do when applying was to submit um, either a video pitch um, describing what they wanted to make or uh, in written form. Um, I would say one of the most common things is that um, when pitching to a public funder often people feel they have to use certain language uh, or present things in a certain way that is more, um, I don't know, trying to intellectualise it and not speaking with their own voice. Um, and sometimes that, that, you know, can make it seem a bit stilted. Um, what we really want to um, see is people who can tell a story in a clear way and, and that brings out the emotion. So um, I would say that's one of the main things um, I've noticed. Um, in terms of do's, um, it sounds incredibly boring, but always read the guidelines <laughs> um, for anything if there are some. Um, there may not always be some, but um, you know, in terms of schemes and things like that, um, they are there for a reason. Um, and try and um, put things across in as clear a way as possible. What is it you want to make? How do you want to make it? Why do you want to make it? Is what we really want to know. Um, yeah. So those are two main things. That's great. I really yeah. love the point about language. It's definitely something that we see a lot of on Random Act as well, where people are sort of really intellectualizing their pitch, and you you just sort of once they hang on in in pure Ron Seal terms, what is this project? Yeah, I think that's a universal one as well. I think for a lot of the stuff, it's quite similar but slightly different because with music videos, there's obviously like a kind of set brief or a parameter because you have a track, let's say. But uh, I think most of that is relevant. I think it's the waffle. I think it's it's too much sometimes. If you can't tell your idea concisely, I think in a few sentences or a short paragraph, you're going to lose people relatively quickly. Um, I think it's different coming from the artist moving image background. Um, obviously, a lot of the um, pitches or applications we see are, are very concept driven, and that's really important for the work, and we really want to see that. But that being said, in agreement with you guys, um, having a, a strong sense of the visual style of the work that you're proposing and, and your voice as an artist filmmaker um, is really important, and sometimes it can lean too much on the concept and we don't quite know what the work's actually going to look like. Um, yeah, just, just being really clear, I mean, often you're so involved in the project and you're really in it and you think that you've said everything really clearly because you can see exactly what you want to make, but we're seeing it for the first time and, and we really want to know exactly what it's going to be. Um, yeah, I definitely echo that. I would also say uh, it seems like sort of sometimes people I don't know that maybe they haven't got someone else to look at something before they send it in because it can be awfully difficult to catch that sort of those sloppy errors in your own work and even if you think that you've proofread something and proofread it and proofread it there might just be a sort of spelling mistake in there that to somebody coming in fresh just makes it look like you can't be bothered and I think one of the main characteristics of successful filmmakers is that they can be bothered and that they do their own work and that they're going to have not necessarily that Stanley Kubrick level of perfectionism doing 50 takes every time but if you can't kind of you know, be bothered to check that your that your, your pitch that you're sending into a commissioner is sort of smoothly written and makes sense then um, I had one today which said I would love to apply for your uh, BBC3 commissioning strand no, no. I'm like, ten or four I mean <laughs> it's uh, it's kind of like basic level stuff but those are the ones that it's quite easy to weed out even if it does sort of seem like a small mistake because you're really just I mean you're flooded with applications every day in a job like the random acts commissioning job and you're almost looking for reasons to turn people down because you cannot say yes to all of them, you mm -hmm. haven't got that much money. So don't 
give us obvious reasons to turn you down, I think would be a big no-no. I don't know if I Yeah, so obviously coming at it from a slightly different perspective, because generally when I'm putting, when I've been pitching something, it has been um, as part of a team, um, and normally as part of a bigger company, um, so you're pitching something, so you do have the opportunity to go and pitch direct to a commissioner at Channel 4, or BBC, or ITV. Um, but I think some of the, um, I think some of the learnings from that can still be applied at the level that, that, that I think you guys are mostly at, which is that um, I think if you're really passionate about an idea and you think it's really good, I think that going above and beyond what might be the bare minimum um, demonstrates that you really actually back yourself on the idea. And I think it's never been easier, or, or the, the equipment's never been more accessible um, in terms of being able to do things like, you know, sort of, uh, sizzles or like even like you know shooting the first minutes or something or concepts and, and things and I think that if you can you share what you mean by sizzles in case anyone's not familiar well, sizzle, as in so uh, you know if you're pitching a half hour documentary um, uh, a, a 60 second taster of what that documentary is going to be um, with stuff that you've just grabbed from the internet you know without you know just because it's going to be shown internally it doesn't need to be what, what's actually going to be seen but just a taste of what that is and I think to give them an idea of, you know, especially if it's something quite stylized or something that, that, that requires, you know, quite an individual sort of you know, style or, or approach, then it can demonstrate that this is kind of what I'm getting at. It doesn't have to be polished or anything like that. It's just a, a sort of taste. And I think that really helps. It obviously doesn't help if you're doing a paper pitch. You know, it's, it's, it's more of a second stage. You're in the room with someone or you are submitting something where they can actually look at something. But I think that um, it always it always impresses you if someone has gone beyond what you expected and where they've sort of actually done the work. And, and I think that most of you will probably have the tools and the skill set to do it at a basic level. Um, and I think that, that um, that's something that I, I think is, is really important. And um, I would say, I think there was one other thing I was just thinking of. I mean, we might get onto this in, in a bit, but I think the other thing is being aware of the fact that as an individual, there is a limit to what you can be commissioned to do as an individual. At some point, you are going to have to either collectivize with another group of people, or you are going to have to be part of, a, you know, become part or, or you know, join up with a company. And I don't think you should be afraid of that or think that it's going to ruin, you know, your creative vision or anything like that. Because there are certain doors which will only open to you if you've got someone you know, walking in alongside you, who, who, who the, the commissioner or the company or whatever. Or trust. So, um, you know, I, I wouldn't. I would say I wouldn't feel. Um, you know, I think that's really important. Yeah, that's so true. I mean, even at, it doesn't even have to be a really established production company like the Pulse, But I know when I get in, uh, you know, a pitch from somebody saying I want to make this with my two friends, and we've already made three short films together that did really well and got into a festival or something like that. That's just really encouraging because you're like, okay, these people know how to work as a team and they've delivered together before. There's a little bit of track record there. Um, I also really like your point about Scissor Reel. It made me think of um, when Pulse were pitching 20,000 Days on Earth, a documentary about Nick Cave, to film four. I saw that Scissor Reel and it was wonderful. They used loads of stuff from kind of David Bowie, loads of stuff from different pop videos, and it really helped you see what the film would feel and look like once it was sort of put on its feet. Way more easy than actually describing that particular project in words. I people think. want to be able to, it's easy for people to visualize something and it's easy for people to like understand it if they can see it. I think when we're dealing with such a visual medium anyway, the, you know, writing something out is a good exercise, but more to your point about like getting people to do video treatments, that can help sometimes. We've done that with music pitches as well, where some of our directors will do uh, video pitches and it's so much it's something it's refreshing for commissioners to see something different and, and it, you can you can visualize it a lot easier i think and that works for a lot of things mm. sizzle reels as well Definitely. i started on the monstrously negative note of like things not to do and we've gone positive which is great but, uh, <laughs> any more do do's things that you really do want to see from people uh, or things that tend to make uh pitches stand out as a commissioner for you i think just leading on from some of your points you know references as well can be good as long as they actually mean something to the project, um, don't just stick them in there because you feel you should, but if there are relevant ones that you feel um, would give a better impression of what you want to make, absolutely use those. Um, if it's something meets something, you know, um, or if you say you want to blend different genre elements and you're you know, looking at these different references, it's always really helpful. Um, I think 
I think more to your your like teamwork kind of point earlier as well. I think you can bolster your your pitch. Say, for example, if if you want to direct something, but you want an element of dance, if you if you bring on a choreographer and you can bolster your pitch with that person as well, you can show that a you can work in a team, but also that there's a lot more strength behind uh, what, you, what you're going to do. Yeah, collaboration is really really important. Yeah. I think um, that's what it's all about. Yeah, this uh, filmmaking for sure. And recognizing maybe you know you can't do everything, and there are other people that have other strengths, as you said. You know, um, if you're an artist working on a project and, and you're not very good with sound, you can work with someone who will be able to bring that side of things to your project. I think um, we rely a lot on um, seeing examples of previous work and um, not to bring it to a negative note, but just checking that if you're sending a Vimeo link <coughs> that the password is correct or you have provided a password. I had one today that wasn't. It's very common. Yeah. <laughs> Um, we see that like a lot and we really want to see your previous work and, and get to know you and if you can't access it it's really frustrating um, because it just puts a downer on your on an application that would otherwise be really really strong. Um, I guess we're talking a lot about the actual documental material that you're sending in. Um, what about like the sort of logistics around it? I think I'm thinking of things like so from my own experience if someone sends in something for me to look at and they're there in my inbox at the end of the day saying I just wanted to check whether you'd had time to look over this, it's, those materials it's like I absolutely have not I've had a hundred of these today and maybe I had meetings back to back so what would you sort of say on, on any advice on that kind of logistical side because I would say if you've sent something to somebody wait at least a week before doing that polite follow-up email but on the other hand don't be afraid to follow up after a month if you haven't heard back let's just sort of try to think about what reasonable timelines are for that sort of thing and you know, if you're in doubt and there's somebody, you know, a friendly course tutor or somebody like that, that you can say, what do you think is the polite amount of time to leave? Um, that sort of stuff can all be really important because it isn't great to be hounded by somebody, but sometimes if you're in a very busy job, uh, if things do fall through the cracks, it's definitely worth following up. And it also makes you look like somebody who's able to be organized and follow up on a project and run that kind of, it sort of suggests that working with you will be a good experience, uh, quite apart from how good your ideas might be. Yeah, I mean, I, I'd agree with all of that, really. I mean, I think it's a, it's a, it's a difficult thing. Obviously, if it's, a, if it's a sort of public call where you might not have an individual to deal with, you're, you're just, you know, it's sent into a system, then you've obviously just got to go with whatever the system says, you know, uh, and there'll be normally sort of deadlines that they'll send you a, a response back. It might be a while, you might have to get wait till the next level before you can actually sort of communicate directly with an individual. But I think if you're sending something to an individual commissioner, you, you should, yeah, be aware of the fact that they've got a lot of stuff that's coming in, um, they may well work in different ways. A lot of commissioners literally will put everything into a, into a big folder. I know at least one commissioner at Channel 4 that does this, and they will take their, they, they do a nine, oh, what's it called, it's a, they basically, they do nine days on, and then they take a day off, it's like a five, five and four, basically. So they on their day off, they basically go through all of the pictures that have come into them, and they do it in one go, and they just get in that, that, that zone, and they just want to do it, and they do it at home, away from distraction. Now, the fact is that your pitch might come in the day after they've just done that, and the next one might not be for three weeks. Uh, and the, but the reality is that they will come round to it. Um, so, you know, it's kind of sort of being aware, yeah, not sort of like every other day saying, hey, have you everything yet? Have you everything yet? Uh, they probably will just say no because you've annoyed them, um, which is not fair, but it's the way it works. And, and I think being aware that you're often you are dealing with human beings, and sometimes for whatever reason, it might just not be the right thing for them. Commissioners are human beings. They they have their own interests. They have their own um, biases as well. Um, researching them, seeing what they made before, it's not necessarily a guide to what they're going to commission now. But it's you know it's not rocket science to know that if someone has got a background in a particular genre and they're now commissioning, even if they're commissioning quite a broad genre, um, they're probably going to at least be more interested in listening to an idea around something that they themselves have made stuff of in the past or have got a track record of commissioning in the past. Um, so, could, so look at that, also look at what they're publicly asking for, because obviously you don't want to be sending them a load of stuff that's around them. Can you make a question there? Ah, oh, yeah, this comes up quite a lot, especially, I mean, it's... Um, Could you all hear what the question was? Uh, how do you protect your ideas from being stolen? So, 
on the one hand, there's an element of uh, there's this. I could just say to you, uh, you know, don't be paranoid, don't worry about it, um, no. it's fine. Uh, but we all know that it, it, it can happen. I mean, I think that, um, th that you have to accept that mm. most ideas will always have an element that will cross over something with something that someone else has come up with. There are, the, the phrase comes up, you know, there's no new ideas. Well, of course, there are new ideas, but they're normally combinations of things that have come before. Um, I don't think it's a problem necessarily with commissioners. Um, they they don't necessarily steal ideas. Like some people think that commissioners steal ideas and give them to other people that they prefer to make them. Um, it probably does happen, but it doesn't happen in the <coughs> course. It's it's more of an issue, I think, if you're sending ideas out to production to, to production companies. Uh, when I was at Maverick, we used to get lots and lots of ideas sent to us, and we didn't like get it doing that. People used to just send them anyway, because the thing is, we we once someone sent you an idea, sometimes they'll send you an idea, and it's actually just really similar to something that you're developing, because it's an idea based on something that's happening in the world. It's not unthinkable that ten other companies are going to be doing that. And even if you responded back saying, "Sorry, we've got an existing idea," sometimes they'd be like, "Right, well, clearly you've stolen it, um, or you've taken my idea, and now you're doing it." And it was impossible to win in that circumstance. Um, so I would say. With commissioners, there's nothing you can do about it because you've got to send them your idea. You've got to send it to them in the in the full. You know, you've got to you've got to let it all out there. Because otherwise, how do they know whether to make the right decision? Um, but if you're looking for partners, people that to take your idea, co-develop it with you, take it forward, I think look at that company and, and sort of suss them out and decide whether they are legitimate and have a chat with them and, if necessary, get them to sign an agreement in advance. You know, you can do that sort of a legal document where you can give them a taste of the idea and say, is this something you'd be interested in? Are you already developing an idea in this space? And if they say, yes, we're interested, no, we're not, then it should be okay. I mean, I would say as a commissioner, um, you kind of, in my experience so far, I've not been doing it terribly long, but when you really fall for something, it's generally you're falling for the whole package. It's the person, it's the idea, it's the way that they're going to realize that idea. It's what they've done before. I've not yet had the experience of having an idea come in and gone, well, the idea is great, but I don't want this person to do it because part of liking the idea is, is liking the whole package, I think. I mean, unless you're talking about something sort of really unique. Well, we know something specific about one of our lecturers who um, they won an award for a short film screened around the world, mm. um, he talked to an advertising firm, they made him sign some you know, documentation, and then all of a sudden there's a massive worldwide advert mm. in the world's most famous footballers, is it? You know, like how can you litigate for that? That's really tricky, isn't it? Advertising is pretty notorious. I think there's actually a blog that goes seen here first and sort of shows you the original <laughs> internet viral hit followed by the yeah. advertising yeah. campaign that seems closely based on yeah. it. I would say most of those big advertising firms kind of know what they're doing legally and would make sure that the idea was sufficiently different that it would be hard to sue them, which is just, you know, really, really a tough one. So I'm not sure on that specific case whether I can say anything very useful, but certainly with the sorts of organisations that you're talking about here, we're not going to go, that's amazing, but I want Andrea Arnold to make it, you know, it's your idea. Yeah, we would never um, discuss an idea that's come in from an artist with any other artist that we're in conversation with. It's just not something that we would do. Um, obviously, we're a publicly funded organization and any open call scheme that we do, uh, we also have an assessment process with an external person coming in um, just so you know we're protected and all of the artists filmmakers are protected and, and they feel confident in sending in their ideas. Um, you know, from my point of view, I would never ever um, even consider sharing information in that way. <laughs> Never had that problem before. <laughs> That's your <I'm> lucky. <laughs> What's the idea? <laughs> I, I, yeah, I, I feel like I kind of on the different side, less against the kind of maybe negative aspect of like being worried too much about your ideas being stolen. But I think you need to. Don't be. A, you need to get your ideas out there. Yeah. So uh, in, uh, a lot of people get caught up is like oh. It, not just they're going to steal them, but more to the point that it's not good enough or no one's going to like it and stuff like that. You need to share your ideas. They'll get better the more people, I think, are involved and kind of feed back to you. So I wouldn't let it hold you back. Necessarily. Yeah, for sure. I mean, if you feel um, uncomfortable about sending through material as well, I mean, maybe it's different for an organization like ours, but we're always really happy to have a phone call with someone before 
um, they fill in the application in case you have any questions and, and maybe it is a waste of someone's time and they're not eligible but they're not really sure. Um, I don't know, a phone call isn't something, you know, you're not receiving material that you can then use. Um, I think it's worth doing it if, if you're concerned or, or maybe you don't know whether it's worth your time sending information to an organisation. Sure, it sounds like you're saying, you know, explore the thing you're going to be sending to mm -hmm. the Yeah. And, have a ch and, and, and talk to someone there, talk to the person you would send it to. Yeah. I think you can tell a lot about whether someone's going to, you know, most human beings are pretty genuine and, and most companies also are not out there to steal people's ideas because, because <laughs> yeah, but ad, ad agencies, are, if they are a really different beast, they really are. Um, I mean, I'd also say it's something to think about if you're uh, in a position where you're getting asked to read scripts yourself, um, which people do with me sometimes. And I think they, I think that used to happen more when I was doing more film criticism, actually, for some reason. But it's actually something that I didn't feel that comfortable doing because I was trying to write my own projects. Mm -hmm. And if I happen to, and if someone's sort of bringing me a project because they know I like horror and I'm trying to work on a horror script and then it happens to be in a similar area, I don't want them to sort of then go, oh yeah, this person's ripped me off. So it's, if, if you're being overwhelmed with friends trying to get you to read their scripts, it's quite a good excuse to sort of say, actually, no, I, I don't want to do that. Um, I've got too much on and you might think I've stolen your idea. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I think we had a question here. No, I was just interested in what you're saying about uh, strengthening uh, an application or a pitch with some sort of group of people, mm. but just that it's, it's interesting to actually finding a network, I know this is kind of not necessarily a place to ask the question, but how you sort of find your, your plan, people really to, that you can trust with a, a pitch and how you sort of work out. All of you. I mean, yeah. you know, I think like you, you need, it's hard, but you need to kind of like know what your strength is and kind of understand other people's strengths and you're all probably incredibly talented, but you, one of you might be a better editor, somebody might have After Effects experience, you know, all this kind of stuff. And I think, yeah, you just need to kind of look around you, basically. Yeah, and watch stuff. If you think, oh God, the sound design on that was really, really brilliant, you've got credits there, and, and try and find out who that person is and maybe contact them about working on your project. You know, it's a, it's a really great way to see what different people's capabilities are. The first film I produced, I came on board initially as a publicity consultant because I worked in the press, the friends who were making the film said, oh yeah, Catherine, can, will you do our PR? I said, yeah, absolutely. And I just got more and more involved with the film to the point, and you know, volunteering to do stuff to the point at which they said, you know what, you're not really doing our PR, <laughs> you're basically producing the film. And so that turned into a producer credit. So I think helping with the things that people know that you're strong on can also <coughs> lead to that kind of wider thing. And then those, those people that I made that film with, um, there's now sort of three of us, we've set up our own really small limited company and we rotate the roles around. So one guy mostly directs, but then the others have tried directing. Um, one guy mostly does the composing, but we also sometimes get other people in. And it's a really nice and collaborative, but it came out of that first sort of, this, you know, just pitching in where people's strengths were. I think also, um, I don't know whether this is something that you've moved beyond, but I know at a certain point in our lives, we all want to be the writer-director because we maybe don't know how exciting it might be to be the production manager or to be the producer. Do sort of find out as much as you can about other roles in film. You probably know all this already, but I think there is that phase where everyone wants to be the writer-director because that's the sort of starry thing that you perceive as, as being the only thing worth doing in film, and that's just absolutely not true. I would say also in terms of, you know, do you feel you are really a writer director or might you just want to direct something that somebody else is writing might you want to team up with a writer um, that's definitely something to think about as well mm. there's so many events on in London things like shooting people and you know filmmaker get-togethers where I think if you're bold and just talk to people about what you want to do hopefully you can find some kindred, kindred spirits I think the point about putting stuff out there and I think that's where the, there's an advantage putting stuff out there because uh, it's not just about you finding people but it might be about people finding you as well so if you can go out there if you've got a particular angle or style or particular thing you know create something put it out there it doesn't have to be brilliant it could just be very experimental you know things like Vimeo and stuff are very good for um, uh, you know for, for new filmmakers just to put their stuff out there and I know for a fact that like production companies like ours 
we do, like you know, for various reasons, look at it when we're looking for, you know, people that we might need to, to work on certain things. Um, I mean, it's at a certain level, but it actually goes right the way down to a more experimental level. Um, yeah, I've, I've got someone on Monday <coughs> whose job for two weeks is to look through Vimeo for loads and loads of short films uh, in a particular doc documentary genre um, that we might be able to license for something. So they are just going to spend their time going on Vimeo and looking at just that stuff um, for ages. So, what's the person's email address? Uh, what's the person's email address? <laughs> uh, I don't know, they haven't started yet. So, um, but yes, the, so, so the point is that having content out there is uh, really important because um, it will allow other people to discover you as well and, um, and, and I think that's really helpful. Do we have any more questions? We've got about 20 more minutes and then we're up to the sort of the hour and I thought rather than go on for an hour and a half because that is a really long talk, um, we would just make ourselves available for if there's anyone who doesn't want to stick their hand up in the room and you know be on camera and all of that stuff, you can just come and find us and it might also be that you know, our specific experiences speak to you more one-on-one. Um, -on -one. But more, more questions for now, I saw a hand. I was wondering whether if you had got a deadline for applications coming up. Really. So this is the first time we're running it. Uh, we do hope to run it again, so watch this space. Um, but yeah, it would probably be next year. <coughs> I think I saw another hand, but they've gone away again now. With Creative England, because I'm like from Wales, but I don't live in Wales, is there like, if I was applying to make a short film in Wales, let's say where you are, I wanted to say film here at the summer, would, if there was a like opening for funding for Film Hungry Wales, would it be like the same to get in England? Like, how is it to connect it? So we have separate funds <coughs> to check the criteria um, with Film Agency Wales. Yeah. If, if the project's set there, would they put it? I think they might, yeah. I've, yeah. Okay, so I'm going to get a little bit um, deep. I think it'd be interesting to think about the, the psychology that's helpful when you're pitching to people because I think people get sometimes quite kind of you know, angry and disheartened <coughs> if they've spent ages working on a pitch and they've sent it off and it didn't go anywhere. Um, so what can we do to make sure that that's not our feeling about the whole process? I mean, something that I think is really helpful is always to have as many irons in the fire as possible. If you've got like five different projects that you're working on at any one time and they might be at different stages, you know, one of them's just an idea, one of them's something you're working up as a treatment but you don't know where it's going to go yet, one might be a response to a fairly specific brief that you've seen on a kind of, on a Creative England type website, another one might be one that you've already just started to make off your own back without any money but once you've got a rough assembly you'll be applying for completion funding. Try to have, I think, as many things as possible so that if one falls through you've got like, well I've got, I've got those four others that I'm working on. I think that's always something that's really helpful. I don't know if anyone else has any sort of psychological tips for thinking about the process of commissioning and pitching in a way that doesn't make people want to give it all up and go work in a chip shop. Don't be worried about your hit rate, I think. It's like, it's always really hard. I remember working for a production company, which is like, I think the the average was like one in seven pitches we'd win or something like that. That's a good average. Which is, which yeah. is, which is, which, 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 which I'm saying, yeah. it's like, oh, that's a really good average for a good production company. So, I, and, you know, so I think don't be, don't be disheartened by getting turned away. It's, it's really hard, but like, even people at a high level are struggling to get noticed or get things made over the line, I guess. I think what a lot of people find difficult is um, not getting feedback because you won't always get any feedback on why it's not commissioned or why it's not accepted, uh, which can be quite frustrating because you feel like you're kind of coming against brick walls. But I think that's where it's important again to you know be talking to your filmmaking peers and be bouncing ideas with each other as well. Um, I mean, we we read everything that gets sent to us, um, and even if you know you're not the one that gets the project taken forward. Um, we're still reading your project and getting to know you as, a, as an artist filmmaker and um, maybe it's just you're not quite at the right time with your project or chances maybe there were many many applications and there were always going to be too many for us to possibly do all the good ones um, but we do come back to names of, of people that we like their, their um, applications from previous rounds of schemes and um, sometimes we'll get in contact with them about other schemes that we're running 
and we think it might be suitable for those. So just sending something in is is getting your your project out there and your style out there and that's a really great thing. So yeah, don't be too disheartened if if you're not the the project that gets taken forward. Yeah, no, that's so true. Uh, we'll keep your CV or your portfolio on file. It's not just a line. People do, I do, I have a, a folder of kind of these people are interesting. The thing they pitched wasn't quite right, but just so that if, when they come through again, you can go, oh yeah, that was that person. Um, and they're having another go, so that shows that they've got that kind of robust mentality where uh, they're not just going to collapse at the first hurdle. <laughs> um, because you need that as a filmmaker. And again, it sort of suggests you'd be a good person to work with. You're a problem solver and you're going to go away and rethink and come back if it wasn't right that time. You could also look at the sort of innovative ways of, um, you know, the non-commissioning ways of making stuff. Um, obviously the obvious one that's grown, uh, in fact you've used crowdsourcing for mm. uh, um, the, your the films. Um, that's obviously, it, it, it's, you know, it's not without its pitfalls and problems, but um, you have a, an honest, if, you, if you're really passionate about something and you're pitching it, and it's, you're just not getting anywhere. It could be the idea is not good enough, maybe. But maybe it's just it's not. You haven't found the right funder, or it just didn't fit that box, or, or whatever. But if you're genuinely really passionate about it, you think it's a good idea. Sort of strip it back and think: if I had to make this on my own, or with just my, my limited resources, how could I go about doing it? Um, what's the sort of minimum cost? Then look at sort of if there is a sort of cost still. Is there any sort of smaller pots of money that you can sort of tap into? Um, as in sort of like, you know, whether it's, um, and it can be sometimes local money, as in like if you live in a particular area, I know people who've applied to sort of like councils, not that councils have very much money these days, but there are sometimes schemes that are not specific for a filmmaker, but are just for, you know, sort of people in a particular area. Um, and sometimes you can put together enough to give you the resources <coughs> to actually sort of go out and either make it or at least make some of it. And, um, and and then there's that idea of uh, you call it completion. Some call it completion funding. That sort of thing, you know. So there are, I think, opportunities where you can take something and and money can come in at the end to kind of get it ready to go to festivals, for example, or to give it um, a final. You know, we can come in and do you know polish it for want of a better word. If by that point you've actually made it the vast majority of it and it's good and it's tangibly good because it's there in front of people. Um, it's not a zero-sum game, is I suppose what I'm saying. It's not the fact that you either have to have it completely funded by someone or you have to make it yourself. You can make some of it yourself and then you can get people interested at the, um, at the other stages. Yeah, that's so true. Commissioning, <coughs> particularly in film, is not this monolith of I've been commissioned or I haven't been commissioned. With the film that you mentioned, um, which was an essay doc about teen movies called Beyond Clueless, it never even occurred to us to try to pitch that to, you know, the sort of, BFI or Film 4 or Creative England, not because those in, those organisations aren't brilliant, but because you can look at the slate and see why would they commission people who've never made a film before to make a feature length essay doc about teen movies from the noughties and nineties. It, like, it, it just doesn't fit with what they're doing. But at the same time we thought there's probably some people out there who would be into that. So we pitched it effectively you know, to the internet on Kickstarter, which is a really I think a really good way of thinking about any pitch is thinking about how you would market your film to a wider audience. Because if you can do that, then the commissioner can imagine how they might do that once they've got the finished product in their hands. And then once we'd made that film, we did get a little bit of money in the US. Uh, it, I can't remember the exact terms of the deal. It was something like if a US distributor had wanted to take Beyond Clueless on, the BFI would have match funded that distribution. So that would have been an example of money coming in at a late stage. Uh, as it happened, we sold to Netflix, so we didn't do that. But um, but yeah, there's always those sort of different bits of money at different stages. Um, I absolutely don't think about it as this thing where if a film's rejected for development funding or for production funding, it's been totally rejected. There's always ways and means, I think. Do we have any more questions? Are we kind of addressing uh, everything that you're hoping to hear about, like how you get the money? Do, would you like to hear more about sort of how you get into the room with these people, or how you kind of hear about schemes? Like, what, what, what's useful? I'm gonna pick on this guy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, getting into the room. Getting yeah. into the room. And that first maybe like contact, mm -hmm. timing that, or what's the best way to do that? I mean, from my point of view, I think networking was a big part of it because you can apply an open call, but 
open calls tend to attract thousands of applications and they're brilliant and they're brilliant from a commissioner's point of view in that you do you do get that really wide range of people but from my point of view it was much more about kind of going to as many film events as I can there's so much free stuff on in London I mean this is a brilliant example of it um, but going to as much as you can meeting people uh, making connections I'm doing some development on a feature film at the moment and that came about as a result of kind of basically buttonholing a commissioner and saying, look, can I come and talk to you about this project? And I came and talked to her about that project very informally over a coffee and she said, look, the right scheme for this particular project is this scheme. So just talking to people who know and telling them specifically what you want to do and it might even be a five minute chat will give you kind of more connections than applying to every single open call scheme out there. I don't know what you guys would think about that. Maybe something uh, quite different. <laughs> my, I guess the the world that I kind of come from, in the, I mean, music videos is a, a, a little bit different. It's similar, I guess. A lot of the relationships that you need to kind of work on are ones with artists, musicians, who you can kind of use and kind of use their platform, use their audience to kind of work with them and make an idea, I guess, together. That's probably a really great place for you guys to kind of start. And I think music videos, I think, have been. That's why I kind of like love them to start with. It's always a great platform to be creative in and, and reach a really big audience, uh, generally speaking. Especially now, I think uh, there's a kind of a new wave of interest with like the tech companies getting involved now. Uh, Apple, Spotify, all wanting to make visual uh, work for music to get get people onto their platforms because that's what it's all about and I think if you want to make something you want to have a little bit of funding that's probably a good way of getting going about it and most of the most of the best work and most interesting work comes from directors who have a relationship with an artist and they're able to work together uh, and make something really interesting. Um, in terms of starting a conversation, I mean, um, the film team at Creative England, um, just like uh, what you said earlier, we, we are really open to um, just talking to people who are interested in applying. Obviously, we have specific schemes and pots of money available at any one time, but if there isn't anything that we can point you towards within our own organisation, we'll do our best to say, you know, Film London are running this, mm -hmm. or Film Wales you know, are running this, or, you know, you might want to look at the FI website. Um, but yeah, obviously, our expertise lies more in the public than anything else, but you know, we'll advise as far as we can. Um, I'm always happy to talk to people. Um, yeah, I mean, again, it's you know, we have a very strict application process, and that's just the way it works for us. Um, uh, it is, you know, we're open to discussing things before people apply as well. Um, but yeah, it's sometimes um, what's nice is that we have people coming up through short film schemes and then um, going on to, you know, making their first features and participating in some like eye features, which is our low budget feature when we can see. Um, and then you start to build more of a relationship rather than going on a project to project basis, you're, you're really having a relationship with the talent, so, and that's always interesting for us as well. So we do like to support people beyond um, the run of any particular <coughs> scheme or um, yeah, for sure. We we find the same thing that um, the organisation's been running for around fifteen years in various different guises, and um, you know you you see that certain artists have been involved in various different schemes along the way at the right point, you know, for them. Um, yeah, it's the same thing. Obviously, we all of our schemes are open calls, and and that is how we manage. Um, running our commissioning schemes um, so the kind of networking is obviously always going to be helpful going to lots of different arts events is always going to be helpful but um, for us yeah if you if you have any concerns give us a call and um, we're always happy to talk but just doing the applications really and I feel like the word networking ooh, I feel like the word <laughs> networking is kind of 
easy to misunderstand as this really gross thing where you put on a power suit and hassle people with business cards. I mean, it's literally just having conversations with people in settings like this and in the ICA. It actually, it took me a really long time to realize that, but someone said, you know, you're really good at networking. And I was like, how dare you? I do not do that. Um, but I realized that what they meant was just talking to people. That's, that's all that it is. As soon as you know someone, you're much more likely to want to help them, I think. That's just a sort of real basic, fundamental human thing. I think it could be a lot easier now as well, with like social media and mm. stuff. Like, you can, I mean, when I was a kid, I think it was harder <laughs> to get, harder to get like an email address for an artist or something. Nowadays, you can go into anything, like, tweet yeah, you can <laughs> tweet them, you can Instagram them, I don't know, God knows. And you'd be surprised what you get back. Like, you know, I, I wouldn't be afraid to do that. Cool. Yeah, Twitter is how I know my main collaborator, Charlie Line. He was um, sassing me on Twitter when I was running the film for Twitter account. Trolling. Like several years ago. Yeah, honestly, that's exactly how, how that connection first happened. Um, we were tweeting about the Danny Boyle season on film four, and he tweeted back, isn't it always Danny Boyle season on film four? Um, which was infuriating at the time, but then a friendship grew out of it, and now several features. <laughs> I guess, um, do you have any more to say on the networking? Right. No, no, I mean, it's the same. I mean, like I said, my, the, the, the experience of working in TV is even more probably infuriating in terms of the importance of know, who you know rather than what you know. Some of the broadcasters have, have, have tried to break that cycle by, like, so now everything has to go through BBC Pitch, if you want to pitch anything into the BBC. And so, in theory, go onto the BBC Pitch website and you're like, brilliant, I can pitch, I've got all the list of people here, I can choose to pitch, if I want to pitch the controller of BBC One, I can pitch to her, if I want to, you know, and, and the actual reality is that it doesn't work in the way that it's supposed to work, because those commissions are still as busy as they always have been, so they're always going to take a call or an email from someone that they know first, rather than something that's in a massive long uh, thing. Though they are supposed to look at things, it's just that you've got to be realistic and say that just because the system's supposed to work in a particular way doesn't mean that it actually works in that way. Um, that's why the importance of actually trying to get in the room with someone, like say go to an event, you know, talk to them afterwards, um, see if they, um, you know, at least then they, you, there's a place to the name kind of thing. Um, and then, you know, being sort of gently persistent, I think as well. Um, if you can say, and, and trying to be informal as well, like, you know, if, if you if you really just want to have a coffee with someone, genuinely just want to sit down and just have a chat um, and just say, look, I really like it, I'm a new filmmaker, I'm anything, flatter them, do all the rest that you want to do, but just say, look, you know, if I came over at some point, could I have a coffee with you in the Channel 4 canteen? Um, it's safe space. They, they, can, they can get security to remove you at any point. Um, when you're wearing your power suit. When you're wearing your power suit, exactly. Um, you know, again, just don't expect it tomorrow because they're probably really busy. But you know, they're all nice human beings for the most part, and they will they will back then, you know, starting out at some point. Um, so I think that there is a lot in that. So being sort of persistent, and, and then once you have got a personal connection with someone, even if they're they're not the right person to pitch an idea to, they may be the right person to run an idea past and say, how good idea? Who do you think, you know, is this a Channel 4 idea? Or, you know, do you think I could pitch this into Sky, maybe? Do you know anyone at Sky? And, of course, the whole industry is interconnected, so you'd be surprised what people can say, hey, yeah, uh, you know, I can do an intro to you, and they'll they'll take your call or whatever. Any more questions, or shall we go to the informal networking part <laughs> of the event? Uh, one here. Uh, I just had a question about, um, uh, I was really interested in comedy shorts. Um, I was wondering, particularly with, I mean, I think because it's funny is the answer with comedy shorts um, mm. in terms of why. So, yeah, like it's difficult to sort of make everything that we're saying right now apply to every kind of thing that you might be pitching, but. Um, yeah, we can catch up afterwards and talk about uh, how to pitch comedy shorts. I mean, Loco at London Comedy Film Festival are doing a range of exactly those kinds of events when that's on in, I think, early May. And the festival directors there, Jonathan Wakeham and uh, Denise Hicks, are really, really approachable. And they're so keen to sort of help people out who might be from outside the normal circles of people who get really high up in comedy. So 
I definitely recommend them as a starting point. Does Channel 4 still do comedy blaps? Do oh, they do do comedy blaps. I'm not sure how open call it is now. Yeah, um, Channel, Channel 4 do a thing called the comedy blaps, which used to be commissioned by a guy called Jacob Smith, who's not at Channel 4, which makes me wonder whether they are doing it the same anymore. But that was a really good pipeline of new sort of like experimental comedy. Didn't have to have a sort of necessarily a broadcast outlet. It normally just, it just um, so therefore could be could fail and it wouldn't be an issue, which obviously is important to comedy because it doesn't always land. Um, but I don't know if that is still going. That was a good, that was a good source of, of, of early conditioning. I think they asked if they had to do it like through a production company. Yes, so yeah. But you know, I mean, production, the, the thing is, that's what I was saying about mm -hmm. that idea of, of, of that opening a door and not be, and not being um, too sort of precious or scared about that it feels like it could be frustrating um, going about feeling like you first got to go and get in with a production company in order to then get in with a broadcast it feels like you're almost putting more barriers between you and that eventual kind of sort of pot of money to make your your, your show or your, your film um, but actually what you're doing is you are they will exercise some quality control over your ideas because if you can't impress them you won't probably impress the commission. Oh, that's just the truth. Uh, and they'll also have those relationships that will probably take a lot of your time and effort to try and cultivate. They'll already have them, so therefore they can jump you ahead. Um, and then, you know, irrespective of anything else, that there's it's that point about whether you work with other people. There will be, even if it doesn't come to anything on a company level, you'll probably get exposed to some people that you might be able to work with outside of the company by sort of doing that. And I think it's just important, it is important to be careful about your IP and all the rest of it, but not to get so precious about it. Keep your um, ideas broad when you're pitching, when you're talking to people, you know, don't give away this, every facet of it, um, but give them enough that they can actually judge whether it's a good idea or not. And then be prepared to, you know, give stuff away in order to get yourself in front of the people that need to be there. Um, what I would say. I, I think that it's definitely a good idea to work with production companies. They, they are there for a reason, otherwise we'd all just be working as independent, sort of one or two men. And, and I would say definitely, uh, which is slightly repeating a point for those of you who were there yesterday, but commissioners are so impressed by people who have that, this is happening with or without your help approach. You know, I, I'm going to do this film, whether or not you want to come on board, this is what the film is. I think that's always immensely attractive, partly because broadcasters are afraid of missing a trick and you know, you, you might be the next big thing, but if you're going to go and do it independently, they, they don't look like they've got their finger on the pulse. So it's certainly that kind of make something independently first for not very much money. And if you make it and it's brilliant, people will be kind of all over you to make the next thing. That was our personal experience with the Kickstarter film that had been in cinemas a month and the BBC rang us up and said we want to do another one with you, how does £100,000 sound? <laughs> yeah, sounds great. Uh, it got commissioned really from that phone call to being set up in an office making the film in about a month without having to even do that process. So you can kind of consider your first bit of work that you're doing for free in a way the pitch to do the next bit of work, yeah. if that makes sense. Uh, there was one question there, I think. Yeah, um, yeah could you talk a bit more about sort of the landscape of schemes out there and um, what, kind of, what kind of schemes are there for it's probably a really good one for Creative England to jump in on. You guys have got sort of a real overview of that sector. Um, so the one that um, I've been talking about, Short Flicks, um, it's for young people aged 18 to 25. You've got to be not be in full time education, employment or training, so it's quite a targeted one. Um, obviously, you've got random apps, um, which I think is open in some. Yeah, we're open movements. call, so anyone can send um, us anything, and they do. Um, but a lot of it's brilliant, <laughs> thankfully. Um, and then you've got um, short schemes through the BFI's net of work. Um, so I'd advise you to go on that website and have a look according to where you live and what it is you want to make and where. Um, and then there are lots, if you're interested in professional development as well, um, a training, that kind of thing, um, there's a lot out there as well at the moment. So um, I know that BAFTA are running quite a few things that are open for applications, um, such as their BAFTA crew. Um, Most places will have, um, even if they don't have some, you know, some, I'm thinking of the big organisations like the BFI, even if they don't have something that's 
that are up and running when you happen to pop onto their website they'll mostly have sign up for our newsletter to hear when our next mm -hmm. sort of round of funding opens or our next scheme is happening so just you know ruin your inbox sign up for everything that you can find that's out there um i mean we've got something in at the moment that came as a response to a bbc call for uh responses to the idea of doing something around post-war propaganda sort of a spin on listen to britain and that came into our inbox it's never something that we would have thought to make something about but it just i think kind of removes a big part of that research work where you're looking for briefs if you can just sign up to everything that's going to send you that stuff i mean i constantly it's sort of something every week i think from you know, sundance or from sheffield dot fest or from um london comedy film festival there's always stuff out there that you can respond to um for artists um there's uh arts council small grants for the arts um you have to have made um some work before uh, in order to apply for it, but you can apply to anything up to £15,000 and um, you'll hear back within six weeks about that. Um, I would advise maybe if it's the first time you're applying to them to give them a call um, beforehand just to introduce yourself and also maybe don't go for £15,000 straight away, um, but it's always worth um, thinking about the Arts Council. They, they do have a lot of um, schemes as, uh, as well that aren't kind of on a rolling basis and maybe a more specific that might be suitable. Um, on our website, we kind of have a notice board that we put, you know, open calls up on uh, from different organizations. And then I think the Film London main website also has one. Um, so, you know, if you don't want to spend all day looking at hundreds of websites, it's quite good to be able to go to one place where they'll be kind of collected. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, you've mentioned shooting people, but there's also a um, creative skill set runs um, an online um, platform called Hive, Two Eyes, which they, people tend to advertise um, opportunities and courses on there as well, so it's worth being. What was that ground called? The which ground one? The one that I was talking about, yeah. um, small grants for the arts. You have to be coming small from a, the yeah, you have to be coming from a visual artist background or kind of perspective. <coughs> um, it, it, you can't apply with a kind of mainstream film idea um, but yeah the small grants for the arts is it's always open and they review um, the applications every six weeks so there's a few I, I go to quite a lot of the documentary festivals most of them do have pitches open pitches that you have to apply to pitch on um, they are very competitive um, because obviously a lot of people <coughs> the type of people that often are considering those pitches are quite senior and a lot of people to get in front of them but if you don't apply you don't ever get a chance of being in the room and with something like that winning the money or winning the pitch is amazing but actually it's not the real reason to be there the reason to be there is to get your work in front of people and to be in the room with all of those people so that afterwards you can go up and talk to them and give them your card and you know chase them down the corridor and all the rest of it so it's worth doing that sort of stuff and not being um, not worrying too much about the actual kind of outcome of the pitch. That's kind of the bonus. It's about actually the experience of being there. However, I would say that some places do charge you to pitch, um, mm -hmm. and you know that's an overhead. It can be, it can be perfectly legitimate if you're at a level. You know that there are there is a cost associated in posting <coughs> these things and all the rest of it. But you know, yeah, be watch careful. out for fees that seem dodgy. I saw, yeah. saw one the other day that was charging people seventy quid to read feature film scripts, and the prize was something like a read through of the script. Like that's mm. obviously scammy, and they were making themselves sound very official, and they'd actually uh, used some <coughs> logos from some fairly big companies in a way that was not at all legitimate. So mm. do watch out for that sort of stuff. If it if it kind of smells fishy, it probably is. Mm. Um, any more questions, or shall we? Ah, one more there. So, just for the people who may be having, I've been producing many commissioning or grants, mm. could you just explain the process of maybe what comes afterwards? Um, after you've so you won the pitch, or after yeah. you've just sort of sent it off, or so if you get given the commission, mm -hmm. so like what made it like next? Like That's when the real problems begin. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> With random acts, I mean, we're kind of a fairly experimental open strand, so we wouldn't be seeking to do loads and loads and loads of development and giving you endless rounds of notes before you would start making the short. Uh, if it's feature development, obviously that's a massive sort of investment usually on the part of the company, so they want to make sure that they're not 
going to be sort of throwing half a million quid up the wall for no reason. So they will want you in a development process to engage with them. You might submit a first draft of a script, they would give you notes on it. Second draft, more notes, third draft, more notes, might never even go into production. I mean, it, yeah, getting the commission <laughs> to develop something can be only the very first part of a very, very long journey, which is, I think, another reason that actually making your first project something like Kickstarter can be quite a good idea because it, you get the freedom to make something without that kind of slightly onerous process of development. Um, but hopefully, I mean, you guys, what's it like when you commission? So it's slightly different um, on our uh, new scheme. Um, we use a kind of scale and filter model for a lot of our um, programs, um, which, um, for example, we've, we've used on iFeatures um, for some years now, um, whereby we develop a slate of projects and then only some of those will get the production finance. Um, so you are going through a development process with a cohort and you are in competition with each other. <laughs> um, and it, it is the model that we're going to follow for short books as well. So we're going to develop 20 projects and then at the end there will be five that will get production awards to actually make them. So and what happens is, to the ones that have yeah. been developed that they don't, don't get the awards? So they get really to keep their question. script and they um, can make it? or Yeah, I mean they're free to go elsewhere um, for funding obviously. Um, we would um, have, you know, conversations with them when they exit the scheme just to make sure that we try and point them in the right direction and make connections for them where possible um, you know for example on iFeatures there have been um, projects that were not as successfully greenlit but that were made with more money than we were offering so there's always you know um, we only fund three through iFeatures so um, you know it's, it's, it's not very many um, so yeah, we definitely, the hope is that more than just the ones that get a production award will end up being made at the end of the day. It's helping them to try it. And it, maybe it sounds like a disappointment, like you got this money to write a script and then they didn't uh, end up funding it as a full film. But actually, I think it's pretty brilliant to be given money to write a script. You've been paid to write and yeah, then you've that, still got the script at the end of the day. So. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, with us, it's slightly different. Um, we want to support the artists um, getting the work made but we don't want to have any kind of um, we don't want to put our mark on it we like to have a curatorial conversation with the artists and support them um, and help them realize the, the work in the best way possible where they feel comfortable as well um, some of our schemes come with development funding and that pays for bespoke mentoring so I don't know an artist might want to pay someone to sit down with them to look through their script um, and that is done in kind of a creative conversation with us where we think you know that money would be best spent but it's also again um, completely up to the artist and we also pay for their time um, so it's slightly different we don't have a kind of structure of notes or anything like that it's really just us working together and, and trying to be as supportive as possible. I think one of the nice things about I guess sort of more things in the area of prizes or awards for scripts or for film ideas is that some of those are really just you know you, you've won the award here's the money go and do whatever you want with it so that could be an option for people who are feeling like they want the freedom to not be given notes and feedback <coughs> although I like notes and feedback you know it might not be the right note but if someone's identified a problem with your script then there probably is a problem there the solution might not be right but it helps you eventually get it to a better place I think. Uh, let's wrap up there but if you've got any more questions just come and find us in the ICA cafe um, I'm going to be there for like at least half an hour an hour so yeah just come and say hi thanks very much <laughs> <laughs>